No bumper video feels a little weird. <laughs> All right. Well, good, good morning, everyone. My name is David Manuel. I am the youth director here at Lighthouse, and so grateful to be here uh, bringing the word this morning. Now, uh, we will be in Romans chapter 10, so if you do have your Bibles, feel free to take them out, and uh, we be just a little bit. Well, um, in high school, I had a job um, at a water park as a lifeguard. It was at Raging Waters in San Dimas, California. And one of the most frequent um, drownings uh, would be uh, people just being completely disoriented by, by going through the, the, the dark slides, winding everywhere, and then they pop out right at the very end into the pool. And so now they're like skimming across and sinking a little bit and then um, in water, completely blinded by the light and, and <laughs> really disoriented. And so the drowning starts to look like, like a turtle kind of trying to, needing to flip around. And, and you kind of wait just a couple seconds to see if they're going to recover. If not, it <laughs> you know, you jump in and, and all you got to do is just here you are, and they're like, hey, I know, I'm better. But that, that is um, one, you know, kind of experience I had with lifting people out of the water, drowning. And uh, yesterday, we had pool day, and no one drowned. So, um, th praise the Lord. Uh, but it, at pool day, <laughs> yeah, uh, we... Uh, we were teaching, there's a, a sweet little girl named Darlene, and, and Kate was, she was, kind of knows how to swim, and Kate was showing her, you know, the strokes and everything, and, and we had these little dive, to, uh, you know, little things that you can throw out, and she would go and practice swimming and holding her breath and grabbing it, but she got flipped around at this one time and kind of felt a little disoriented, and so she had a moment of panic underwater, and Kate was right there, and kind of just was smiling and lift, let her, reached her hand towards her. And Darlene, I could see even, was like, yeah, I need that. And so, and so she, she reached for the hand and um, was like, oh, did you see that, Kate? I almost drowned. But um, she, she didn't. So, uh, but that, that's kind of what it's, it's like when, for us in our, you know, situation as, as sinners before a holy God. We, we are drowning. We can never be above water in our sin to really save ourselves, but we really need God's hand to lift us out of the water. And so uh, it's, it's kind of hard to just jump right into uh, Romans chapter 10 because there's so much context leading up to chapter 10. But the main theme, the main sort of the development uh, throughout this book is the gospel. It's, it's, that is, we, we have been saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ our Lord. Now as Paul lays out God and human sin, the law, Christ's grace, he uses many contrasts to, to bring clarity. And one main contrast Paul makes is the, you know, the Israelites, the Jews, and how God has um, given his law to them in contrast with the Gentiles who they did not have a law and yet they still had no excuse for their sin because both Jew and Gentile, Jew and sinner are both under the same predicament um, before God. And what predicament is that? It's that we are all sinners before a holy God in need of saving. Even more so, there, there is nothing that we can do to save ourselves Paul articulates how the Jews have, have attempted to live a righteous life by living according to the law. But no matter how much Paul writes in Romans chapter 7, how he tries to live according to the law, sin prevails. So this relationship between pursuing righteousness by living according to the law and receiving God's righteousness given on the basis of grace through faith in Jesus Christ is what we'll look out today. Um, so for those of you, again, with your Bibles, uh, turn to Romans chapter 10, and if you all would stand with me as we read scripture together. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them, the, his fellow Jews, is that they may be saved 
For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The Lord is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. You may be seated. So Lord, we, um, we thank you for this word uh, this morning and, and ask that, I ask that you would just be so clear um, by your spirit to, to lead every one of my words and that you would just open all of our hearts to receive you. So thank you, Lord, for your grace and your goodness. Amen. So um, the question I ask you is this, a uh, couple questions. Who saves... Is it by what you do or what God does? Is it by your will or God's will? Is it trying to live a good enough life or is it believing in Jesus Christ alone? Well, the the Apostle Paul was, was the writer of Romans and it's important to know who he was as a Jew, that he was a Pharisee and And the Pharisees were a Jewish party that prided themselves on being the most strict and the most pious lawyers. lawyers. And the the law being the Torah, the the first five books of the Bible. And so Paul uh, is is this converted Jew to, to, to Christ. And he kind of goes and, and, and talks about how he was really kind of the best of the best if you could be the best Jew, it was Paul. He was, you know, circumcised on the eighth day uh, uh, the, from the tribe of Benjamin. He was, um, you know, just every single thing that you could be, at, like memorizing scripture at this date. And, you know, he even says he was maturing beyond many of his own age. And, and so he, he was he, the best Jew he could be. And now all of a sudden he's saying, I'm the worst. I'm, I'm of the worst sinners. And so you can kind of just see that there's, there's no way that you can really, if you've been formed like that your whole entire life, there's no way really to explain um, how he can have such a shift without the, the work of the Holy Spirit working in him. Now Paul shares how much he desires his brothers according to the flesh, that is, his fellow Jews, how much he desires that they would come to believe in Jesus Christ and be saved. And he goes so far to say in Romans 9.3 that he wishes he was cut off from, the God, from, from Christ, that, he may be, that they may be saved, which is just an incredible statement to say that he basically would rather be in hell and switch places with the, the Jews that don't know Christ so that they would be able to, to know Christ. But let's go back to, to verse 1 and 2. He explains that the, the Israelites who reject Christ actually do have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. So basically, there's, there's a, a knowledge about God or regarding God, but not according to knowledge. It's almost like saying before, you know, Kate and I were, were, were even friends, uh, it's like, I can know about her through her mom who says, you should still meet my daughter, um, but I can't actually say I know her. And even in uh, Galatians 4.9, it says, but now that you have come to know God, or rather 
that you have come to uh, be known by God. So we see that there's this, this knowing is this intimate personal relationship of knowing the other. And so we can see that, that you can be zealous for God, about God, but what Paul is saying about the Jews is that they don't actually have a knowledge that is an inner relationship with God. As verse 3 says, the Jews were ignorant. They simply did not know God's righteousness. Because if they did, they would submit to him. They would, if they knew God and his righteousness personally, they would know that they are dependent and, and on submitting themselves to God, the, the only God, that is, holy and above all else. And so if they, if they did not know God, if they did know God, they would recognize that they are sinners, um, desperately in need of saving. John Calvin, the, a great reform, uh, one of the great reformers, talks about this as the double knowledge of God, that when we come to know God, we come to know ourselves before him. And so the command of Moses is to do them, to do the law, to do the work, the commandments, and to live by them, which he's quoting Leviticus 18, where it says, I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my rules. If a person does them, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. So what did the Jews do? They used the Torah, they used the law, not depending on God's help by faith, which would reveal their sin and need for a savior, but sought to establish their own rules and righteousness standards from the law. So they're, they're actually, I don't know if you guys know, but there's 613 commandments given in the Torah. How in the world are you supposed to keep all 613 perfectly? Well, the law was, was never meant to be a permanent solution, only a temporary guardian or tutor. And so a, a tutor to reveal God's standard of righteousness. And when you honestly assess yourself before God's law, but before his righteousness, you would come to see your own sin for a, and need for a lasting solution, a savior to deliver you from sin forever. As verse 4 says, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And so you might be wondering, well, what about all the Jews before Christ came? Were they not, um, were they not saved? Well, they followed and lived by the Torah, but they were not counted righteous by it. So what were they saved by or counted righteous by? They had faith in Christ. Yes, get this. Even Moses, from whom the law was given through, looked to and believed in Christ. Hebrews 11.26 says, He, Moses, considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt. For he was looking forward to the reward. For the Son existed before his coming in the flesh. Hebrews lists many examples of this. 11.13 says, All these people died in faith without having received the things they were promised, that is, Christ. However, they saw them and welcomed them from afar. It was all by faith in God, looking towards Christ, that those from the Old Testament were counted righteous. Hebrews 11 has the, Hebrew, the, the heroes of the faith. By faith, Abel offered a, a better sacrifice than Cain, um, and it was counted, commended to him as righteousness. By faith, Noah warned about the things not seen, and he became the heir of righteous, the righteousness that comes by faith. Abraham believed God, And it was credited to him as righteousness. And so without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who approaches God really must believe that he exists. And not only that, he rewards those who earnestly seek seek him in in their hearts. So if we go back to to verse 4, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Why? Why? Is this saying that because of Christ, now the law is irrelevant? No, rather, the law was forward-looking 
to Christ. Christ is the telos. He's the end. He is the end of the law. It is and always has been about Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1 says, even before the foundation of the world, God chose us in Christ to everyone who believes. Now that, that it really never was about the law, but believing in Christ. And as you believe in God and, and, and by faith, you desire to walk by the law and to follow God and to um, see and know his goodness and who we are before him. The law was really given to reveal our sin and bring everyone subject to God and his righteousness as sinners. So technically, can, can a person live by the law perfectly and not need a savior? Well, we all know how that went with Adam and Eve. Now, because of our fall, we are born into sin. And so in Psalm 51, it says, even in the, our mother's womb, we, in, we are conceived in the, in the womb, we are in sin. So, but for the sake of the argument, let's say we do a live according to the law, to the commandments perfectly. We've never stolen, we've never committed adultery, we've never lied, we've never killed anyone, we've honored our father and our mother our entire life. But now, Jesus takes it one step further and says, if you've even looked at a woman with adultery, you've committed, with lustful intent, you've committed adultery in your heart. If you've been angry at someone, you're now subject to judgment. So can you pass this test, this rigorous test of being righteous enough according to living on your own in, by the commandments your entire life? Well, let's just say you did pass, but if you think you can, you're really lying to yourself. So there, there you go. You're faulted right there. But let's just, let's look at the rich young ruler who thought he might be good and righteous enough to merit eternal life on his own. He came to Jesus and inquired, teacher, what good thing must I do to ob obtain eternal life? And Jesus said, why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones, the man asked. Jesus answered, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. All these I have kept, said the young man. What do I still lack? Jesus told him, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. And so what did Jesus say? Be perfect. In effect, he said, go love and follow me. In other words, repent. Turn from your own ways and follow and love the Lord your God Jesus, with your whole heart. So again, the, the end of the law is Christ. It starts and ends with following Jesus. Christ is our Lord. And so the Jews pursued this law without really pursuing God. In a way, made them look really good, uh, from, uh, you know, among others, and righteous, uh, without really seeking God in their hearts with faith. So in reality, the law was meant to teach us about God and how we ought to live and reveal our sin in the process and, and thus show us our due reward. Eternal life? No. Death. Which is the reason Christ came and paid for your death on the cross. That the Torah was really meant to illuminate our sin, to illum illuminate our inability to keep the law, and to show us that we really truly are enslaved to sin. For living by trying to be good enough by the law is, is hopeless. We see this in verse 6 where Paul contrasts the righteousness that is based on trying to live good enough and the, you know, the righteousness by faith. He says, the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven or who will descend into the abyss? But what does it say? Now Paul is quoting Deuteronomy chapter 30. For this is the commandment that I have, that I command you today, is not too hard for you, either is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend there? 
um, and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. And neither is it, is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea and, and help bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. So in, in other words, he's kind of saying, it's just, it's impossible. Who can do this for us? We, we can't do the law. Who could ever be good enough to make it into heaven? And, and in, here in verse 6, who could ever, who's going to heaven to be good enough? And who's going to hell? Because we don't really know. We don't, we're, we're kind of hopeless. But it, he's saying that the law of, of uh, the righteousness by faith is not that. The righteousness by faith is saying, Christ himself has made the way for you and for me. He's made it possible. God is the one who sent his son into the world. God in Christ is the one who has lived this blameless life according to the law perfectly. Now, God is the one who paid the price of death for your sin, for my sin, for everyone's sin. God is the one who has enabled you by his spirit to choose him. The righteousness of faith is saying, don't think this way where you can't get it, that it's out of reach. Because it isn't too hard. It's right here. I've done it for you. How close? In your heart and on your lips. He's basically saying, I've done everything. All you have to do is believe in, in me and what I've done for you yourself. It's kind of like saying, I've done everything for you, even given you the ability to, to, to believe in you. But now he's given us that opportunity, that, that invitation for us to choose, to say yes. So this is the truth. Um, Paul, Paul even states it in Philippians that my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And so the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so that you can do it. So Christ and the Holy Spirit are leading the dance. I, I, I barely dance, but um, when at our wedding we kind of practice a lot, and I, I don't think that I, I led very well. But a good dancer can lead really well to where you just kind of fall into it and you just keep going. And that is kind of like what Jesus does for us. He leads the dance, and we just simply... He's given us the ability to keep up with him, and we just have to say yes. And so verse 9, it goes, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so if you what? Confess and believe. Now when we confess something, it's not a lie or a false statement but it's the truth. We're confessing the truth. How do you respond to truth? You either accept it, you confess it, or you deny it and you lie. But you cannot do both. This is why, you know, in a courtroom, lawyers will say, this and this happened on this day. True or false? Yes or no? Now, if we confess with our mouth, we say it out loud so that others may hear and not be ashamed of this truth, but what exactly are we confessing? That Jesus is Lord. Now, what do we mean by Lord? It can mean master. It can kind of give, you can be a, a Lord that is, you know, it can be used to say that, you know, it indicates deference and respect. And uh, I think of like a British accent, you know, yes, my Lord. Uh, but this is not what the text is saying. When the Lord is all capitalized in the Old Testament, it's really the name of Yahweh that's, that is it's ascribed to God alone. Divine, unchanging, transcendent, above all else, above human, above human thought or, you know, words, meaning the Holy One, the Lord of Lords, no being higher, the Creator. So furthermore, Jesus, the, his name, Jesus, literally means Savior, in Matthew 1, it talks about how G she, Mary, she will bear a son, and you shall name his, you should name him Jesus. Why? For he will save his people from their sins. So Jesus, he's our Savior, 
and he is our Lord. He is God. So we, when we're confessing that Jesus is Lord, we're saying, Jesus, quite literally, you are my Savior and my God. So believing in, in his one and only Son, the Father's one and only Son, uh, that, that we, we come to believe and choose to believe in the way, in this way, in saying Jesus is Lord, and this is really the only way he gives us. That he, Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so even though he was born 2,000 years ago, he has always existed as God the Son. He is Lord over all. The cross here, it's the, the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. And so what's the, the next part of that verse, uh, verse 9? Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Now this is the heart of the matter. It is in full connection with the confession of our mouth. But our mouth cannot do the believing. Our mouth merely, you know, states what is already in our hearts. We must truly believe ourselves that Jesus is God and that God raised him from the dead. Now you might be thinking, well, if, if the verse says, uh, about, it talks about God raising Jesus, then is Jesus really God? And, and I respond by saying that Scripture reveals to us that, that this God, our God, the only God, is three in one, that he is triune. He is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This we believe in the Trinity. And so this is crucial because all persons of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, have this essential role in our salvation. For the Father sent his Son into the world, the Son accomplishes it all for our salvation, and the Son now sends his Spirit uh, to, to allow us to, to apply salvation to us. And, and as we do, as we say yes, he, he sends the Spirit into our hearts and seals us forever, as we just sang about, seal, seal our hearts for thy courts above. So we must confess with our mouth and believe in our hearts. Now notice this is a both and. This is stating both together, our heart and our mouth. And it's, it's not to say that the mouth saves, but faith. For with the heart one believes and is justified or counted righteous. And I don't know if you've heard the question of, have you given your life to Jesus before? But this really is the best way to state it because it's our whole life and being surrendered to Jesus. It's our, our heart at the deepest part and it's our faith, our mouth, our body, everything, soul and body saying, I believe, Lord. As Romans 12 says, it kind of helps us make sense of this that that we are to present ourselves as living sacrifices to God. So it's, it's our whole being, it's our whole self before God. And we turn to Jesus from our sin and present ourselves in his saving and lordship in us and over us. Or what? We believe in Jesus and are saved, or there's only two options, we deny this truth for it is a truth, and we disbelieve in our hearts and remain in our already condemned status. That, that we, in John 3, 16, that we are already condemned because we have sinned before a holy God and we deserve death because of our sin. And so Paul then finishes with this sort of amazing statement that when you believe in Jesus, there is really no distinction between Jew and Greek, Jew and Gentile. There's no class difference. There's no hierarchy. There's no separation. That everyone is brought into submission of the true God, Jesus Christ. And I think this is so important to remember that even though we might look different between you and you and I, come from different backgrounds, what, what have different things that define us in Christ we are all equal and in value of, as God's son, that we are in Christ. And so we are all in God's, we are all called God's beloved. So let's circle back to what Paul was contrasting. 
the righteousness that is based on the law and the righteousness based on faith. And this amazing truth is that Jesus is the end of the law. For when we confess with our mouth, Jesus, you are God. He is our God, my God. And we believe in our hearts, meaning no one else in this room can do it for me or for you. And only God really knows. The f- God the Father raised Jesus from the grave. You will be saved. And so I ask you, is, is this salvation dependent on your will or God's? Yes. It is only by God's grace. Grace meaning unmerited favor from God. I know that Pastor Kurt has been talking about the gospel for many weeks, but this is a gift. This grace is a gift. And what's the gift? It's that Christ died for us, for you and for me. This is, this is the good news, that, that grace isn't given to people who have their lives figured out and perfect. I, I, I've heard a, a saying before that, you know, that God blesses those who work hard, and, I, and I'm sure that that might certainly be true, that God might, may bless you and, and bless the work that you do, but this is, not, this is not the gospel. The gospel is that you don't deserve this. Christ says that he came for sinners. This is why the cross is really offensive, because the people who deserve forgiveness the least, God forgives. And they, he, they receive God's riches at Christ's expense on the cross. So it's important for us to, to sort of look at how those seemingly below us are, are looked by, by God. So it, it, it's God's will for us to be saved, and truly, he has made the way for all of us to be saved by the cross. That Jesus' death on the cross is sufficient to forgive everyone's sin in the whole world. But does that mean that everyone in the whole world is saved? No. Scripture tells us that, the, that some will deny Jesus. But Jesus desires and invites all of us to be saved. He even says in 2 Peter that, that this is, um, it is for patience, that God's patience, um, that everyone would be saved. And so really, again, he's leading the dance, that you... He's reaching his hand into the water as we scramble and are drowning. And he's wanting to save us. And he's just asking us to respond by saying yes. That you personally have to respond and believe in Jesus for yourself. And when you do, you cross from death to life everlasting and are truly in reality in Christ and sealed with the Holy Spirit in your heart. For everyone not just some people, but for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus in faith will be saved. Acts chapter 2, verse 38 says, And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, Everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. So here it is. The offer still stands to us all to choose Jesus. I invite every one of you to confess these words after me. So one, Jesus is Lord. We'll say it one more time. Jesus is Lord. Now just take a moment and just let this sit in your heart. Now you you might be even struggling with believing in God. You're with with believing in this gospel. But you can just tell him and, and tell him and be honest and say, I believe, Lord, even help my unbelief. Now, I I imagine many of you have believed in Christ for many years, that this this church is about to hit 150 years, so not saying that everyone is there, um, but to think that there might be very seasoned, mature believers in this room. 
And this might seem elementary even to you, but, but I remind you of what the, the Apostle Paul tells us in Galatians, that we are to walk by faith and keep in step with the Spirit. So do not make the same mistake as the Israelites had to attain righteousness by, by works of the law, by trying to be good enough. As he says in Galatians 3.3, are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now trying to perfect yourself in the flesh? Because the gospel is not just a one-time gift we accept, but the gift of salvation is a relationship with God forever. And so we never reach this place in our walk with Christ where we have, have it all figured out and we don't need to depend on him anymore. But if anything, we learn as we walk with him more and more that we can't do anything apart from him. For one of my favorite verses is John 15, that whoever abides in me in Jesus, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And so part of, part of this Christian life is realizing that we can't do anything apart from Christ. And you might be wondering, what does this mean for me? And I invite you to pray. Ask him. Maybe God is calling you to trust him and believe in Jesus Christ for the very first time. Maybe God is calling you to, to restore a relationship with someone. Maybe he's calling you to pray for someone. Maybe, he, maybe he's calling you to just, you know, trust that he has your finances or lack thereof or a job or lack thereof, whatever it is that he's inviting us to trust him as our Lord and Savior. Who, who, whatever God may have for you, remember that Jesus is Lord, your Lord and Savior, that he is your good shepherd, and he invites you to trust him. So today, if you hear his voice, the offer still stands. Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Believe in Christ. Amen.